Book of John, chapter 15. We are studying the fundamental doctrines of the Bible. It's good to have uh, visitors with us from Champaign, Illinois. It's like us, we tell everybody we're from St. Louis because nobody knows where Festus is. Huh? Oh, your son is in Champaign. Oh, wow. Okay. But you guys don't know each other, do you? No, I didn't think so. Big town. All right, John chapter 14. Good to be with everybody tonight. Good to have everybody joining with us online. Everybody listening in in Kenya, I um, I made some notes today. I don't. I'm not sure that we're going to get to them tonight. But uh, when you're studying the doctrine of the Holy Ghost, you have to uh, for this because of social media, because of people watching online and so on. The pervasiveness of false doctrines about everything, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the Bible, about literally everything, you're going to get false doctrines everywhere. And in the 20th century and into this 21st century, you have the rising up of what I consider to be heretical doctrines concerning God's Holy Spirit. The fact that some people believe that when you are full of God's Spirit, you are drunk, and you act like a drunk person, and you fall down like a drunk person, and uh, I've seen videos of churches, uh, one in particular, it used to be Life Christian Center, uh, now it's part of this Faith Church campus. But anyway, they had uh, Kenneth Hagen there doing a service there one night. This was all recorded. And he was going around spreading this drunken spirit on the crowd. And Kenneth Copeland and his wife were there and a bunch of other people were there. And I'm not exaggerating. They were gang piled on top of one another at the front of this church acting like they were drunk in God's Holy Spirit. And I'm talking men and women laying on top of one another in this church service. And Kenneth Hagin's telling everybody, and what he did was he, he, he changed the scripture. He said, be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be ye filled. And then he said, be drunk with the Holy Spirit. He added those words to it. And, of course, everybody's laughing. Everybody's going berserk. It's very lascivious what they were doing. They were calling that the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going, there is no way. But there were probably a thousand people in this one church service. And on a service like this, where we're just teaching what the Bible says, you see how few there are here. And so that doctrine has really taken, you can say that your, a lot of your mega churches are Pentecostal, charismatic, or non-denominational. Joel Osteen's church is a charismatic church, and he has, what, 40, 50,000 there every service, multiple services every week. So that same spirit then pervades throughout not only this country, but it's also all over the world, including Kenya. And um, if people would just read the Bible and stick to the Word of God, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that kind of nonsense. But of course, this is why we do what we do. John uh, chapter 14, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Ask His blessings on the teaching. Heavenly Father, we ask You, Father, that You guide us and lead us as we study Your Word. We believe that Your Word is the truth. And that it is the way, it is our life, it is what we believe, it is what we live by, and it is the book that we will both die by and die for. And I pray, dear God, that you will instill this word into all of our hearts tonight. Teach us, Father, the truth, and uh, help us, Lord, to shine as lights 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation such as the one that we live in now. Father, I don't long to be in this world any longer than you have appointed for me or any of us to be in this world. It's becoming darker, more and more wicked every day. And so, Father, we just pray, dear God, that you'd watch over us, that you'd give us grace, let that grace be sufficient for every part of our life, and help us, dear God, whether we are at here at church or at our homes or wherever we go, help us, Father, that we portray the living epistle that you have written into our hearts, the very word of God written into us, Father, that we convey that every place that we go to everybody that we meet. We thank you, Lord, for those who cared enough to come to your house tonight to worship uh, together, to fellowship, to love one another, and to cling to your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us now. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Um, very quickly, I know I read this last Wednesday, but we're going to start from here. There's several things in the book of John where Jesus sort of introduced the Holy Spirit. He said in John 14, verse 15, and we'll start there. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And I want you to underline that part of it right there. When Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what he meant. It's through the, through the uh, ministry of his Holy Spirit that he is with us. The Bible says we have the spirit of God's son in us wherewith we cry, Abba, Father. Even the spirit of truth in the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And I will leave you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But you see me because I live. You shall live also at that day. You shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. And he that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So we touched on that last Wednesday night and won't go into that any further. So now look at verse uh, 22. Same chapter. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my what? My words. He will keep my words, which means you're going to believe the Bible from this day forward. You're not going to walk away from the word of God. You're not going to turn your back on the word of God like Saul did, like Ananias and Sapphira did, like so many others have done. You're going to hang on to this book. You're going to believe what it says. And it doesn't matter what science says. Doesn't matter what the world says. Doesn't matter what the politicians say. Doesn't matter what laws they pass against Bible Christianity or against Christian thought or the fact that now we can speak out against all types of immorality, including sodomy. We can speak out against those things now, for now. But there may come a time, even in this country, well, that will be outlawed. Well, it doesn't matter. Truth is still truth. The Bible's still the Bible we still have an obligation to cling and to believe those words. And he said, he, he will keep my words. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him and we will come into unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. Notice how Jesus twice now, he's attached his word to whether or not you love him. How many people in this world say they love Jesus? How many people in this country? How many people in... Festus, Missouri, would say they believe in Jesus, and yet they don't believe the Bible, they don't trust his word, they don't cling to it, they don't live by it, They're, the word of God does not abide in them, and so basically Jesus is calling them a liar, because they don't, they don't love him, because they don't abide by his word. Um... He says, he that loveth me, keep, loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, he's identifying him here, 
whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Uh, he men since he mentions here in verse 26, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I don't have this in my notes, so I'm going to go off the notes a little bit. In fact, I don't think I have this in my notes anywhere about the actual pouring out of the Holy Spirit that God promised. Uh, we know the story, but let's read it anyway. Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, and it may sound silly, but believe it or not, I've heard a lot of different things. What were the disciples doing when the Holy Ghost was poured out upon them on that day? What were they doing? Thank you, Cubby. Smartest man in the whole church right there. They were waiting. That's all they were doing. The reason why I bring that up, Lisa and I, we used to, I pastored a, a country church way out here in the boonies, Richwoods, Missouri. And there was a Pentecostal or charismatic church just about in every hollow out there. And they had some wacky doctrines. Uh, some of the people would tell me that one church at the service, everybody got up and started running around the pews. What are we doing? Well, we're bringing in the Holy Ghost. Running around in circles. I wasn't aware in Scripture that that was a requirement for the Holy Ghost to show up. Okay, um, a man told me, a friend of mine, uh, when he was led to the Lord, it was in a united Pentecostal church, and of course they believe you must speak in tongues to be saved. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. So after the preaching, he came down to the altar and confessed his sins and asked Jesus to be his Savior, and they said, okay, you've only got part of it. Now you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Okay. So they said, you need to speak in tongues. Now, here's the question. What did the disciples do when the Holy Ghost came upon them and they started speaking in tongues? What were they doing to get that? Waiting. So they told him, you've got to loosen your, you got to loosen your mouth. Okay. And they called it priming the pump. So they started him saying hallelujah repeatedly as quickly as possible over and over and over again until gibberish began to flow out of his face. And they said, he's got it. Praise the Lord. He's got the Holy Ghost. He's speaking in tongues. Wayne Shirk, who's not here tonight, but he's probably the best that I've ever met at faking speaking in tongues. He can do it better than anybody I've ever heard in my life. Okay. Where is it in the Bible that you have to generate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Doesn't exist. It simply doesn't. In fact, as part of my notes later on, I will show you how you receive the Holy Spirit. And it's not a ritual. It's not some big church service. It's not a televangelist putting your hand on the television screen. It's none of that. It's as simple as believing what God said. Okay? So anyway, uh, suddenly, verse 2, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Cloven, which means divided. The Bible, rightly divided. Old and New Testament. Fire, because is not my word like a fire, the Bible says. And it sat upon each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Fire was a lamp. It's not to burn things, it's a lamp. It, it, it was a light, like a candle light, on, sitting on top of them. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What were those tongues? Was it an unintelligible prayer language whereby they spoke it, no one understood what they were saying, and yet everybody was blessed by it? No. Verse 5, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. That is very important. Because if you misrepresent Acts chapter 2, you misrepresent 1 Corinthians 14. If you don't adequately understand Acts chapter 2, you'll get the rest of the doctrine of tongues incorrect. And early on, as I began to really study the Word of God, just asking God questions, it became apparent to me that God's Spirit is a spirit of knowing, knowledge. I mean, we say, we call, we call it a no-so salvation. I know that I'm saved. These things are written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. And so God's Spirit is a Spirit that when it is in us, it gives us knowledge. It gives us understanding. Try to convince me that God's Spirit comes upon you and you speak something that no one knows what it is. I don't buy it. I don't believe it. It's not, it's not consistent with what the whole of the scripture teaches us about God, about his spirit, what Paul taught us about knowing the mysteries, understanding the mysteries, under, things that have been kept secret since the world began now have been made manifest to us by the scriptures of the prophets. So we're in the age now of knowing things, not, not knowing things. So, everybody there, and it lists them in uh, verse 8, How here we were every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt, and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretan and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongues. The wonderful works of God. We hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Which then set it, it fulfills, if you turn to 2 Corinthians 14, then look at verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 14. Paul said, Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might... Uh, teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. And Paul says, um, where was it when he's talking about praying in the Spirit? Um, verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So even those who say, well, when I pray, it's a private thing between me and God, and I will speak in this language, I don't know what I'm saying. Paul said, when I pray, I know what I'm saying. When I pray, I pray with the understanding. And so he says here in um, verse 21, in the law, and he's quoting Isaiah 28, 11, in the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips. Will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. With men of other tongues and other lips. And that is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit is a spirit of knowledge. You know. Now, um, I won't get into that. I won't make it more complicated than it is. But basically, it's that simple. Some people say praying in the Spirit means praying in tongues. I don't believe that. I believe praying in the Spirit means that you are letting the Holy Ghost lead you as you pray. And the Spirit is guiding you. And then, of course, the Spirit then is saying things with 
to God things that you cannot utter. He's your prayer partner. He's your helper. And I have that in my notes for later on. The Holy Ghost helps us pray because we know not what to pray for as we ought. And the Spirit helpeth our infirmities is part of the job of the Holy Spirit. So there in the book of Acts, when, when Jesus promised the Holy Ghost would come, he did. And when he came, he signifies that he marks that day by speaking to people in something other than Hebrew for the very first time. God speaking other languages, not Hebrew. And this was a sign to the Jews. God's done with you because you won't listen to him. So I'm going to go to all these Gentile people and they'll have my word in their language like we have it right here tonight for us. Somebody say amen. This is God speaking with other tongues right here. And we know what it says. So back to John chapter 14, the comforter in verse 26, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring you all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So you read the Bible. And then you read the Bible and then you read the Bible and then you go about your day. Maybe later that afternoon, God will bring to remembrance something you read. Or maybe you'll read it and people tell me this all the time. Maybe you'll read the Bible and then I'll get up and I'll preach on something and you'll say, I, I was just reading that today. I, that is so cool. I was reading that today. By the way, uh, I have on our prayer list. I preached on death Sunday morning. And I said, I don't know why I'm preaching this. God wouldn't let me get away from the message. But I preached about death and got a call from a man by the name of Gabe. He's been following our ministry for years. His wife just passed away. She was sick. Um, didn't know what was wrong. She said, I'm going to go lay down. I'm not feeling well. And she passed away. 60 years old. And he said, Pastor, you were preaching that for me. Thank you for obeying the Holy Spirit. That's something the Spirit does. Is that He moves and we may not understand what He's doing or why He's doing it. But if He's the one doing it, let Him do it. Because He understands why He's doing it. Let God move. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't try to get in front of the Spirit. Don't try to get in the way of the Spirit. Don't Hinder the spirit. Let God do what God wants to do. And then maybe later you'll find out God, why God wanted it to happen this way or God, why God wanted you to say it this way or why God wanted you to keep your mouth shut. Or you may never know this side of heaven, but trust God anyway. God has a reason. Now, I'm one of these that believe, um, turn to John 15. I'm one of these that believe that if it happened, obviously it was God's will. Or God's plan. If God absolutely didn't want it to happen, it wouldn't have happened. I believe in God's sovereignty that way. John chapter 15, verse 22. Here he gives... Um, no, it's, it's uh, John 16. John 15, 22. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. And isn't that something? People will try to cloak their own sins. Don't we? We try to cover up. Adam and Eve tried that. They tried to cover and cloak their own sin by sewing aprons for themselves. Fig leaf aprons. They were trying to cloak their own sin. Men try to cover up their own sin. Let God do it for you. It's better that way. So he said, he that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass 
that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, there he says it again, the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit will always speak of Jesus Christ. Very seldom does the Holy Spirit draw the attention to itself. So you have this whole movement that almost emphasizes the Holy Spirit over Jesus Christ. You're saved. Yeah, that. and I, I had a, a contractor one time. He knew I was pastoring a church uh, there out in Richwoods. And he asked me, he, he was a Pentecostal. He said, how's your church doing? I said, man, we had vacation Bible school and we had probably about a half a dozen people get saved. He said, oh, that's great. How many were filled with the Holy Ghost? And I'm going, every one of them. But see, he believed that that baptism of the Holy Ghost comes later than salvation. And it's like they emphasize the Holy Ghost even over salvation. Oh, you're saved? Well, that's great. But are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And that's, if you look at this, the Holy Spirit doesn't testify of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. And there's, like I mentioned, the United Pentecostal Church, they say that the, the centerpiece of the whole Bible is the book of Acts, not the Gospels. They say everything in the Bible before the book of Acts leads up to the book of Acts. Everything after Acts points back to the book of Acts, but they're wrong. Acts is only possible because of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because of the cross. And they have it wrong. They are dead wrong in that. They... It's, it's like they exalt one part. In fact, United Pentecostals don't even believe in the Godhead. So they exalt the Spirit above everything else and the alleged movements of the Spirit above everything else. And it's, it's ridiculous. So Jesus is telling us that the Holy Ghost, in fact, when you look at the Bible, everything in your Bible is a testimony somehow, some way of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. Whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, it's all a testimony of and about Jesus Christ. Now, John chapter 16. Now we have Jesus explaining three different things that the Holy Ghost specifically does in a person's life. John 16 verse 5. He said, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And he did exactly that. Fifty days after he departed, or fifty days after Passover, the Holy Spirit was poured out. In verse 8, and when he has come, he will do this. He will, number one, reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Verse 11, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So, this is the book of John. When Jesus is done speaking in the Gospel of John, he says a few more words there in the book of Acts. Then he ascends into heaven. So then we believe then that the things that he had to speak to us, he let the Holy Ghost speak those things to Paul, Peter, James, John, and Jude. I miss anybody? I think that's it. So the writers of the epistles from Romans through the book of Revelation. Those are the things that he said to those apostles who then faithfully transmitted those things to us 
through the pages of the New Testament. So he said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come in verse 13, howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Underline that in your Bible. The, one, of the, one of the operations of the Holy Spirit is to guide you into all truth. I hate being lied to. I hate, no, and who does? Well, some people do. But I hate being lied to. I hate being lied to by, I hate being lied to by my children. I hate being lied to by friends. I hate being lied to by salesmen. I hate being lied to by politicians. But the truth of it is, simply because I hate it, that doesn't mean that nobody from this point forward is ever going to lie to me. Somebody's always going to lie to you. And so then we count on and need the Holy Ghost. Even if it doesn't have anything to do with doctrine, the Holy Ghost can lead you and guide you away from people who are lying to you. The Holy Ghost can actually show you things that other people don't want you to find out or other people don't want you to see. Anytime there is a cover-up of something, there's one who knows about all the cover-ups, and that's God. Anybody ever hear the speech given by President John F. Kennedy uh, against secret societies? Anybody ever hear that? George, you heard that. Okay. John F. Kennedy actually gave a speech against government secrecy and secret societies. He said they have no place among a free society. And he's right. Now, I understand that there are certain secrets that we have to keep from the Russians and the Chinese and the Middle Eastern nations and, and things like that. But the idea that the politicians get to do... The idea that... We can't know what's in a health care bill until after it's passed. That's an abomination to a republic such as ours. Amen? So it should have never, it should have never happened. But that's, that's exactly what he was talking about. Well, God has a way of manifesting things that other people want to keep covered up. And the Holy Ghost, then, is the one who guides us into all truth. Somebody will lie to you about something to mislead you, to do you some form of harm. It will be the Holy Ghost who will let you see the truth of what's going on to protect you from someone who is trying to harm you. That's God's Holy Spirit. That's what he does. Things that you're going to read online, Facebook posts or YouTube videos or whatever... False doctrines out there where people are lying, but they're very subtle with their doctrine. You almost wouldn't catch it, but something about it just doesn't sound right. And so you go to God. You say, God, what, what is, this, is this person telling me the truth or not? And it's the Holy Ghost then who guides you into truth. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they be of God. And so the Holy Ghost then will show you the scriptures that you need so that you'll know whether or not a spirit is God's Holy Spirit speaking to you or it's a lying, deceiving spirit that's speaking to you. It's the Holy Spirit that will do that. It's the Holy Spirit that as you're reading the scriptures and you don't understand something and you might, you might have a misunderstanding of something in scripture, the Holy Ghost then will lead you possibly or probably to other scriptures that will shed light on that. So you'll go, oh, I know what that means now. Don't waste time reading a lot of commentaries. I had a class in Bible college. It's actually one of my favorite classes because all the tests, we didn't have tests. We wrote term papers and I was pretty good at writing term papers. And for the term papers, we had to have a passage of the book of Romans, and we had to consult at least five different commentaries. That was the class, and that's what they were teaching us to do, is read the Bible, and then let the commentaries tell you what it means. I don't necessarily agree with that anymore. 
I say read the Bible and let the Bible tell you what the Bible means. Let the Holy Spirit tell you what the Bible means. Because then that, what? because you read five commentaries, you might get five different interpretations of what a passage means. But if you read the scriptures, God only has one. And God will teach you the truth. He will tell you the truth. He'll never lie to you. So, um, verse 14, oh, oh, no, by the way, verse 13, he will show you things to come. Meaning, God reveals prophecy. God reveals the future to mankind. We're building artificial, intelligent, quantum computers without getting into the technical aspects of that, what, they're, what they know that these computers will have the ability to do is accurately predict the future. They know it. Because a quantum computer will be able to examine, let's say, a chess game. A quantum computer will be able to examine every possible move all at once and know the outcome of the game before it's even finished that's scary we're building a god you understand that right we're building what the book of revelation said we would build we're building our god in this world god's rate of success at prophecy is 100 percent he's never wrong He's never been wrong, and he will never be wrong. And that's what it means. The Spirit, in verse 13, he will show you things to come. I mean, part of what we believe about salvation is we believe the Bible when it tells us it is appointed to each one of us to die. And after this, the judgment. That's the future. Well, if you believe that, then you'll want to do something about it. You'll trust Jesus to be your Savior. And so your hope is that Jesus is telling you the truth and that when you die, you will spend eternity with Him forever in the new Jerusalem. If that's all you need, if that's all you want to know about prophecy, that's enough right there to believe and trust God. Verse, 15, or verse 14, He shall glorify me, for He shall receive of mine... And shall show it unto you. And here's the example I like to give. Revelation 5, God's got a book in his right hand sealed with seven seals. That book is the word of God. He gives it to Jesus. Jesus receives it of the Father, takes it as his own, and he opens the seals. And then the Holy Spirit then is able to convey to us because that's what he says. He shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. I have this scenario in my mind. That I believe one day there's going to be a choice that everybody in the world's going to make. Just like on the day Christ was crucified. They had Barabbas here and they had Christ here. And everybody said, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And I think there's coming a day when the world is going to choose between the real Jesus Christ and another Jesus, another Christ, Antichrist. And I believe those whom God's Spirit dwells in them I believe we'll get it right. I believe we'll get it right. I think we'll choose the right Jesus. Because we'll know him. The rest of the world, they'll fall for it. We know that a great deception is coming. And they're going to fall for it. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to show us these things. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now very quickly... Back in verse 8. Three things the Holy Spirit does. When he has come, number one, he will reprove the world of sin. One of the jobs 
that the Holy Spirit does in your life is to convince you that what you did was wrong. Guilt. Some psychologists will tell you guilt is bad for you. You need to get rid of your guilt. I say be guilty. Feel guilty. Understand that guilt is your best friend. Because godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation that needeth not to be repented of. If you did something wrong, let God chastise you for it. Let, him, let the Holy Ghost reprove you of sin. Teach you what sin is. Teach you that your ways are not right and what you're doing is not right. And you need to stop doing what you're doing. I got a call from a guy. And I'm not going to say much about him. But he confessed some things to me on the phone. He doesn't want anybody to know about. And I said, brother, you better get out on your knees before God and tell God that you're sorry. You don't want to do this stuff anymore. I, I mean, treat it like it's serious. If God's given you grace, then so be it. But let God chastise you enough so that you don't do this stuff no more. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. If you don't feel guilty, if you've done something wrong and you don't feel guilty about it, I'd, I'd wonder whether or not you're saved. Who in here knows that we can talk ourselves into feeling right about things that we did that are wrong? That's just how wicked our flesh is. We justify, it's like I said, we put a cloak over our own sin. We justify our own transgressions and think that we're doing okay. And it's not okay. And the job of the Holy Spirit is to reprove you of sin. That's what he says in verse 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin. And number two, of righteousness. The opposite then of that is that the Spirit then guides us into right living. Something comes up on our Netflix or our television and it ain't right. The Holy Ghost says, look, see what they're doing? That's not right. You listen to how they're talking. That's not right. See how they're living their life? That's not right. The Holy Ghost then teaches us what is right and what is righteous, what is holy. Remember, he's the Holy Spirit. And those he dwells in, he wants to be holy vessels. Do we not still believe as Christians that we ought to lead holy lives? I don't think it hurts anybody to clean up your life. Clean up your music. Clean up your television. Clean up the books you read. Clean up the jokes you tell and laugh at. Clean up the gossip that you're a part of. Clean up the friends list that you have, both on Facebook and in your personal life. Clean it up. And the Holy Ghost will lead you. The Holy... Have you not ever met somebody and all of a sudden there was like, God's going, stay away from this guy. Who's ever had that experience before? You betcha. That's God telling you, you know they're not right for you. You know they're not. And then he says, of sin because they believe not on me. And he said, of righteousness because I go to the Father. And he said, of judgment. See, God's the judge. But then God gives us discernment. Again, to know what's right, to know what's wrong, to know what's good, to know what's bad. God didn't want the priest, when they went in to do the ceremonies in the, in the tabernacle, God didn't want them drinking wine and strong drink. You know why? Because they would be drunk and they would allow an unclean sacrifice in. And God says, that's an, you'll defile my temple and I'm not going to have that. 
I don't want drunken priests allowing spotted goats or lambs into my holy tabernacle. I want you sober. I want to give you judgment. So I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever been drunk and done something stupid. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You see what I'm saying? This is what one, of the, one of the thousand reasons why I don't believe the Holy Ghost makes you drunk. Because when you're drunk, you do things you shouldn't do. When you're sober, you say, uh, I'm not doing that. You use good judgment. That's the purpose of the Holy Ghost is to lead you into judgment calls to make the right decisions to do what's right in this world. When nobody else is, you do it. Somebody say amen.